let's talk about prostate, which is obviously also the the sort of um, the the bread and butter of of the field. Um, so first off, which patients are typically being radiated? Mm -hmm. And so that the answer to that has been evolving. There was a time as recently as probably 20 years ago where uh, we only treated patients who were probably medically inoperable that the, the urologist would say, hey, you know, this is a high risk anesthesia patient. Let's send them to Dr. Mehta for radiation. And that's a big reason why a lot of the older data was not as good for radiation because of the patient selection criteria. Uh, but in the modern era, as we've gotten more and more precise in our side effects have gone down and our cure rates have gone up, now it's pretty much wide open where pretty much anybody who's eligible for surgery would also be eligible for radiation. So there's not that big of a divergence as there once was. So I, I know see you've gotten to know Ted Schaefer. So let's talk about a, um, kind of a, a patient that comes in to see Ted for a biopsy. They've got a Gleason 3 plus 4. Um, and then another patient who's a Gleason 4 plus 4 or 4 mm -hmm. plus 5 or something like that. Right. How does that patient navigate their way through the system as to whether or not they need radiation or should they undergo surgery? And does androgen deprivation therapy necessarily come with radiation? Or is there a scenario where you undergo radiation but you don't require androgen deprivation. Sure. So to answer your last question first, androgen deprivation for high risk disease is certainly standard of care. Uh, Gleason eight or higher for sure. The Gleason sevens are always a, a, a sort of a gray zone. And so a four plus three with high volume disease typically also do get concurrent and adjuvant androgen suppression along with radiation. Uh, but one of the things that's really changing now is I know Ted talked a lot about this with the Decipher score where they can look at the chromosomes of the actual cancer cells and have a much more granular view of exactly are they are they truly high risk or can you die, can you uh, uh, maybe say that this one three plus three plus four is more like a three plus three so we can so for a lot of the three plus fours now with the decipher test and there's also an an AI test I know you had a really interesting discussion with your AI uh, expert of, uh, that wasn't too long ago uh, called Artera and we're using that that's actually in the NCCN guidelines now so that Artera test can help us differentiate between a unfavorable and a favorable intermediate risk patient and essentially, actually, I treated my own father not too long ago. He was the first person I did this on. Uh, the Artera test is essentially they just use the actual images of the H&E slides that were already done from the pathologist. And it's an, interpreted by a machine, uh, machine learning computer that has been trained on hundreds of thousands of prostate images from the old RTOG studies, the 94s, all the, all the stuff that was done back in the 90s. And it can now come back and say, okay, very much like Decipher, it can say that this is a 3 plus 4, but it's a favorable or an unfavorable person in that, in that subgroup. And so because of that, we can stratify better and actually tailor it to where maybe a 3 plus 4 doesn't need androgen ablation at all. And maybe even some 4 plus 3s, so they come back low enough on the scale where you could make, you always have to talk about the side effects and whatnot, but the standard of care was always to give concurrent androgen ablation for intermediate risk. But now we're able to really take some of those people out of the equation with these new studies. And is the main selling point, because most patients just want things taken out, right? Mm -hmm. I have cancer, take it out. 100%. So is the reason that a person might select radiation therapy, especially if it comes with androgen deprivation therapy, mm -hmm because of the sexual function and urinary function? Like, what's the main advantage? Those are number one and number two. Yeah, lack of incontinence and lack of impotence. But of course, when you have androgen ablation, that sort of clouds things a little bit. Uh, but typically, the number one thing we see is uh, uh, patients who don't want to deal with diapers. And for the most part, although uh, incontinence is still described uh, to some degree in the literature, in my personal experience, I don't think I've seen a single patient who came in continent who left with anything less than that. There's no pads, there's no nothing. Um, and then of course also being, uh, uh, you know, with our, uh, as I talked about with breast cancer, we can also focus very precisely on the prostate itself. So the dose to the penile bulb, the dose to the rectum, the dose to the prost to the uh, bladder are so low now that uh, the side effect profile is essentially zero from a radiation standpoint. Now, they may be having hot flashes from the androgen deprivation uh, and decreased libido and fatigue, as you know. But on the radiation side, because we have all these tricks now, very much like with breast, the way we can avoid the heart and the lungs, in the case of the prostate, we can almost completely avoid the bladder and the rectum and even the, uh, the penile bulb now. So the quality of life, those are the reasons why people tend to choose radiation. 
And I know we've talked about this before. Um, you're just not seeing the proctitis. Yes, almost none. In fact, uh, now um, I know. I think Ted had mentioned in his last talk. There's a there's a gel spacer that that is often inserted. It's an, it's an injection that's done transperineally, and it separates the the rectum from the uh, from the bladder. But in my years of doing this, when you're very diligent about how you do this, very much like a you know like a surgeon pays attention to the details, so do we. I can actually trim the dose off of the posterior prostate and just make make sure the dose fall off between the posterior prostate and the anterior anterior rectal wall is so rapid that the anterior rectal wall is always going to get some dose, but usually it's not clinically significant. And, he, and, and what we do to, to manifest, to make sure that that is, is a daily thing, because we're talking about treating patients for multiple weeks, we actually coach the patient to come in with a full bladder and an empty bowel. And by being diligent about that and imaging daily to double check that, in fact, the bowel is empty and the bladder is full, that, that allows those two organs to separate from the prostate. And even a few millimeters of separation is all we need to take advantage of our modern focused radiation beams. What about patients that are inoperable? Um... First of all, you mm -hmm. know, what leads to a patient being inoperable sure. and how do they show up? So, you know, typically the urologists have already screened the patient because everyone's first uh, first uh, exposure is going to be to what the urologist tells them. And luckily in this day and age, I'm lucky we have uh, people much like Ted who are very open and who are very uh, – open to not just doing surgery, but who actually look at the other options and present everything to the patient. But typically a patient who maybe was medically inoperable will, will certainly come to me. But even somebody who maybe is on the borderline who wants wants to see both sides of the token, a general urologist will send them to a, a surgical specialist and to me, and we'll go through all the pros and cons of everything. And really what it comes down to, to not, to not you know, belabor the point, it comes down to two things. You want you want to be cured. Cure rate is key. But quality of life is equally important, if not more important, for most people. And so now that cure rates with our modern focused radiation allow us to get such a high dose into the prostate, uh, we can say that they're essentially equivalent to surgery. So we don't have that deficit like we did 20 years ago when our fields weren't as precise. It was sort of the shotgun approach versus our you know, sniper approach now. Um, be because the cure rates are better, then it really comes down to uh, the quality of life changes. Thank you.